This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Hal Glixman was the head of the book division at Datamost. In two years from 1982 to 1984, Datamost was one of the largest publishers of computer books. In 1983 alone, Datamost published more than 40 titles and shipped 100,000 books per month. Their Atari books included Atari Roots, Kids in the Atari, ABCs of Atari Computers, and the Elementary Atari. Hal himself wrote the musical Atari, Games Atari's Play, and the musical Commodore. Datamost also published software. The company's Atari software titles included Cohen's Towers, Cosmic Tunnels, Jet Boot Jack, Mr. Robot and His Robot Factory, and The Tale of Beta LeRae. This interview took place on April 7, 2017 for me and April 8th for Hal in France. In it, we talk about Gary Koffler, whom I previously interviewed. I was the director of the art gallery of the Otis Art Institute. Are you in Los Angeles? It's still there, flourishing in Los Angeles. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, it's a it's an art school in Los Angeles, and it was going through changes. It was part of Los Angeles County administration, and it was during a budget crisis, and they said it would have to uh, merge or fold. So it became part of uh, Parsons School of Design. And uh, anyway, uh, I wasn't welcome there. (laughs) I had to do something else. And I had, uh, starting in 1977, I met a woman uh, who I've been married to since 1979, who had a child with a disability, uh, cerebral palsy. And I had been uh, part of art and technology workshops dealing with artists and artists go into every realm of everything. So some of them were interested in computers. So I started looking at computers for this child to have a way to communicate. There was a field called uh, augmentative and alternative communication that was just developing at the time. It was message boards and pointers and, you know, various uh, strategies to uh, allow people to communicate who didn't have a voice. And I started experimenting with this stuff. And by the greatest good luck, the first computer store in the United States opened up two blocks away in Santa Monica. So we went there with my son. And he got so excited about these kids and about the computers. I was already 40 years old before I touched my first computer. So uh, we started hanging out in there while I was still running the art gallery. And uh, I wrote a little program. Oh, first, how, how did I learn to program? I met Dave Gordon at a conference, and he gave me Snack Attack. No, no not Snack Attack. Um, Dragon Maze. Dragon Maze was a basic game uh, from Programma International. That was the the company before Datamost, was Dave Gordon's Programma International. So he gave me this game written in basic, and I learned basic by uh, searching through this game. I didn't know a thing about basic. Every time I saw a variable for a color, I would change the variable to a different color and say, "Uh aha, that line does this, that line does that. And I finally, all I wanted to do was to keep the dragon from killing you in the maze because uh, my kid couldn't play it well enough. So I got rid of the dragon. (laughs) Anyway, I got fascinated and I had to teach myself basic. And then... um, Anyway, we bought the first Apple computer in 1978 and uh, went to several more. um, It was called NCC. It was a huge computer conference that went on in Anaheim. Uh, And, uh, yeah, one time at the Disneyland Hotel even. It was really great. And the home computers was in the lobby. The first year, I think the second year, it was at, it got its own space at the Disneyland Hotel, 
while the real conference went on in the conference center. So home computers got bigger and bigger. Right. And, the, the, uh, the real hardware was in the main conference, right? The, the, yeah, the, 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 real, things? the yeah. real computer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, Dave Gordon told me that he sold Program International and he was starting this new company called Datamost. And, and none of his uh, potential authors could write very well, and, and nobody at the company knew anything about publishing. And I had done these very slick you know, museum catalogs and publications for the art exhibits. So he hired me, and uh, I got there. His place was in... Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, you probably have these same things in Portland, these little U-shaped auto repair places where you drive in and there's a whole row of shops, sure. uh, one after another in a little courtyard thing. So he had yeah. two of these little courtyard areas, I think they were a thousand square foot each. Uh -huh. and, and that was the beginning of data most. And the first job I had, he says, hire five people. <laughs> that was my first assignment. All right. So you were hired as a what? Did you have a title? Books. What? What was he calling it calling you? It was unbelievable the the rate of growth of of this place. So anyway, he started out with one book on Pascal, I think it was, in one game. I don't even remember the name of the game. And you know, within a year, there we were on. Um, I forget the name of this little trade publication, Soft Talk, I think it was. Soft, uh, soft Side? Soft something. Talk. Yeah, right. It was more about, you know, the sales, how much of this one yeah. sold. And it had a, a top 30 games and a top 10 books. And we had uh, two or three games and three or four books on, on, the, on the list. So anyway, that's that's how that started out, and and then, well, in the course of of doing that, I started to think, hey, I could write these books. <laughs> I, I was writing half the books anyway. Uh, we had one person. I, I'm trying to remember his name. I'll have to go back to dig in the files and and find out this guy's name. He was practically autistic, but uh, just he could fix anything and build anything. So I said, why don't we sit down with a tape recorder and you tell me what you're doing and how you're doing it and we'll, we'll write a book together. Unfortunately, you know, we never got the book finished before Datamos went over the cliff, but uh, it, was, it was a great idea. It was called uh, Mr. Chip meets the Apple II computer, and it was, it was how to get a little uh, enunciator chip from um, Radio Shack and a little plug-in board mm -hmm. and do experiments okay. where you could see how the, how the computer calculated and learn about uh, machine language and things like that. So we had really lots of fun. Then um, the famous uh, crash of 1983 where half the or more than half of the game companies went out of business. You would go into the record stores. They used to sell computer games in record stores and places like that. And there would be these card tables piled high with, uh, uh, you know, $40 game cartridges marked down to three bucks and nobody was buying it and stuff like that. So uh, all of the games of Datamost fell off the charts. He was going crazy trying to get new games out there on, onto the charts. And he said, we have to have more books. We have to have five books a month. And, and that kind of pressure uh, overloaded the book market. The largest oh, section in, in the bookstores at the time was uh, either travel or cooking. They were both huge sections. Yeah. And, and the, the computer uh, section got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, finally bigger than all of those combined. And then it, it too started to become saturated and, and over the hill. And that was, right. that was sadly the end of data most, but I've it was heard, re really fascinating. I've heard similar stories from a couple of other book publishers that there was a couple of times where, uh, um, they, there was just two, they were just putting out books to put out books. And then right, the exactly. market was, uh, was, 
saturated, like you said. Yeah. yeah. So so Dave's distributor. Oh boy, I, I wish I had all my books in front of me. To remember the name of the distributor. Anyway, they would buy five thousand of every issue right off the bat for cash. Yeah. So um, Dave just said more, 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 more books. So we, we we would collar game writers and and anybody to write a book. So it's interesting that um, games Atari's play. Dave had a silent partner named Matt Weinstock, who was a businessman and also a, a computer nerd, and he loved video games. So he liked to write these uh, very, very simple games in, in basic. And one of the games that he wrote was called Grew Stew. So he wanted uh, Dave to publish this book called Grew Stew with all of his games in it. And Dave hated the title. So there was a... Um, popular book about uh, psychology and self-help called Games People Play. It was on the news. People talked about it. So we came up with the ideas Games Apples Play or Games Atari's Play. I forget which was the first one. And then half the work was porting the games to the other systems. We had to uh, do uh, IBM PC and uh, Apple, which was terrible for playing games. <laughs> Anyway, uh, to, and Atari and so forth. So interesting. So in in retrospect, you said the market became saturated. Was data most part of the problem? I mean, were you churning out stuff because? Oh, absolutely! No, yeah. no, no. That was you know when when the boss says you have to have five games, uh, five books a month. Sure. He didn't care what they were. <laughs> so uh, it was it was kind of sad because. They could have been better. Okay, and yet you guys put out, you guys put out some great stuff as well as the. It, the not it so was great stuff. there was some wonderful books, yeah. wonderful games, and it was it was fantastically exciting to work there, it's especially for me because it was the second career for for me. I was the oldest person there, older than the boss by ten years almost. And for me to be able to get in with all these young people and learn, I mean, I wasn't as fast as any of them, but uh, just just to hold up my own. And of course, uh, a lot of them, the, the greatest game people were dropouts from school because they got so fascinated with the money that they could make and, and the need to get it out there right away fast that they dropped out of school to become game programmers and these kids and you know 19 20 21 years old all he wanted was uh a, um, not a porsche um what, what was the chevy the <laughs> that fast chevy the corvette they wanted a corvette and gold chains with you know that was that was the 80s <laughs> and they got them they got them right away one, one or two games and they were Wow. driving around in Corvette so so they couldn't read or write and uh, <laughs> and David wanted books so so we we cranked out books wow so what was like do you recall like what the best sellers were the ones that that uh, ran were the runaway hits um well the game series oh yeah the elementary series was good uh there was two different uh, you know, for dummies type books, uh, elementary uh, Apple and the Ele and the oh, I don't know, some kind of guide to or how to beginner's guide. Those two, those two were the greatest. And uh, yeah, uh, interesting thing, uh, Jeffrey Raskin, who was one of the Apple pioneers and and started the first Macintosh team. He was teaching at uh, UC San Diego in the 60s, music. And he was trying to get his students to program. And he was telling me while I was working on the art and technology exhibition at Los Angeles County Museum, he was telling me that I should learn to program, that everybody could learn to program. And I, and I didn't believe him. And then I went to Irvine, UC Irvine, and I was a gallery director there for three years at Irvine. 
they had a computer that, you know, timeshare thing. You went over to the computer building and you sat there at a little terminal and typed stuff in. And I, and I learned just basic editing over there because one of the uh, physics professors loved art and he was always over in the art department doing projects with the artists. So, so I learned a little bit there. So anyway, when I uh, got to data most, or got, no, when I started uh, with the Apple learning, learning to program, I got this book that came with the Apple and it was written by Jeff Raskin. And it was just the book that came with the machine called, uh, um, AppleSoft, I think I forget, or Guide to AppleSoft. And um, he set the parameters. He designed the way to write code. You know, you write instructions in one area, and then you write code, and then you, you have symbols for what keys to press. And he designed a little uh, green uh, text no, white text on a green background with a little uh, um, rounded corners for the name of the key that you pressed in what order. And then a certain kind of blocky type mm -hmm. for the for the basic that sort of looked like basic on the screen. Mm -hmm. and, and then a serif type like times for the explanation. And we followed that, actually the entire industry more or less uh, picked up from Jeff Raskin's design for the first guide to computers. And the other thing, I don't know, it's, you know, only interesting to, to people interested in, in books, is the comb bindings, you know, those plastic uh, uh -huh. uh, circles with the, the little hooks in it yeah. on the side of the book? You sure. know what that's for yes. or why that's there? Uh, because it's easier to leave the book, o you can leave the book right. open so you can type. Flat. It's supposed it, it, to it's perfect binding, which wants to close. Cover. Yeah. Yeah. So this always made Dave crazy because they were expansive and they, you required an extra step and, and the book didn't look good on the shelf. That was the main thing. So if you look at Games Apple's play or Games Atari's play, it has a cover with a spine, but it also has the spiral binding inside. So he, he uh, Dave invented this cover, or maybe his designer did, but he took credit for it, uh, that it folded over the comb so it had a nice wide spine that looked good on the shelf of the bookstore. That, that, was, that was his contribution to it. I've seen that, and yeah, it was unique. For, yeah, it looks like a perfectly perfect bound book, and yet you can lay it flat. And yeah, yeah. It. yeah. Nice. So th those were the kind of things. Um, there was an interesting, uh, actually, he was the husband of an of, uh, artist friend of mine, uh, Isaac Mallets, and he was a mathematician, still is a, a mathematician and, and computer programmer, and, and he wanted to do a book on Alan Turing called The Turing Machine, where he was going to have people write a little Turing machine in... Uh, in basic and learn how Alan Turing wrote this thing. I says, nobody's going to buy that. <laughs> what people want to know is what goes on inside the machine. When you press a key, where does it go? What does it do? Where is the letter A inside the machine? What does it look like in, in binary and all that kind of stuff? So he and I sat down again with the, with the tape recorder and talked. And, and we came up with this series called The Computer Snooper, where it's just about peaks and pokes. Nobody knew what peaks and pokes were and how to use them and things like that. It was all fascinating to people. So it was a, a beginner's guide to, you know, making your computer beep by typing in some binary code. It just it was really great because people really wanted to know that stuff. And he made a fun book out of it. So so that's what we did a lot. We brainstormed and then we actually wrote books together a lot of a lot of these kind of things. So anyway, my friend uh, my son actually uh <clears throat> was taking music lessons. And I said I didn't play any music. I didn't know anything about music. And I said to his music teacher, if you can explain music to me, 
and I can write a program that will play music, we could do a book together. So that's where the musical Atari came from because it, it, it of course played much better music than, than any other computer. And, uh, and we had a lot of fun writing that. Cool. And so was yeah. Laura, 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 good friend. That was that the teacher. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, and, uh, <clears throat> I didn't. There's a lot of things I didn't know that I learned about that. That there was only half a dozen uh, typesetters in all of LA that could type music, and it cost a lot of money. Huh. There was no music uh, software at the time that that actually wrote out the music. Sure. So that was the most expensive part of the book was getting these simple little ditties uh, printed in music huh. text. How did that book do? Um... <laughs> It did very well. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Did you get royalties because you were an employee, or did uh... actually, actually, I had um, decided to quit and become an author. So I had uh, given up the management of the book division. Actually, uh, Dave was firing people right and left, and I could tell that I was going to be up up for. Uh, being shot down and and my assistant oh god i gotta remember her name she was so terrific she was better at editing than i was and i said why don't you make her the editor and make me an author and he said okay so i got to go home and and uh got some advances and did the book and lived on royalties for a while nice awesome yeah. all right so so as far as computer Okay, so I was looking for Atari books that you did. I we talked about the musical Atari, and you also were worked on uh, games Atari's play, correct? Yes, that was this one called Grustu that we had our oh. completely rewrite for Atari. So actually, we were the authors of that, but anyway, it's still Weinstock. Sure. So. As an editor, I get it. You do a lot of rewriting, and at some point, what at what point does your name go on the book, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, we didn't. Care about that. What's that? We didn't care about that. Yeah. Just to get the book out and. To... Uh, you're also credited with the musical Commodore. Yes, we got it to play on the Commodore. Never on the Apple, though. No. 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 Not a good sound card. No. You had to add that on. Um, any other computer books that you were credited on? That you remember? Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to remember. There was uh, a guy. Oh, <laughs> can we uh, have another session in August when I'm in, back in LA? I'll, sit, yeah, I'll get my bet. box, of, box yeah. of books out, and I'll have uh, I'll refresh my memory on this. Yeah. But he 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 was going to do the AppleSoft Encyclopedia, everything about basic. And so he wrote a little a little page on each command, and he had fingers. He was he was an interesting guy. Every finger on his hand was as big as my thumb, so that he would do typos. And every time you'd have a word that you couldn't figure out, you'd have to look at the, all the letters that were to the upper left of what you thought it was. <laughs> Because he was hitting everything, <laughs> bumble fingered. But he he came to COS cosine, and he said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about math. I'm going to leave this section blank." And I said, <laughs> and "Dave said you can't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> write something about it." I didn't know what cosine was. I didn't know anything about it, math. So I said, if you come across something and you don't know what it is, a little math thing, put it into a, uh, a little program and have it draw something, and then you'll see what it looks like. So I made a little thing, cosine, and it drew an arc that went up and got steeper and steeper. And, and it was interesting because if you ran this, you'd get a division by zero error at the end. It was really fun because no Nobody knew what division by zero was. So we, we, I practically wrote that whole book for him over again. 
Oh, every, you know, I was reading the history of Atari about how it folded up five times and bought by this one. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Every, uh, uh, Datamos was like that. We started out in the two little auto bays, and I think he was there a month and he, and he rented this huge place, and we all had to move. And he was there for a while and it completely filled up, and he got a, a much bigger place that we never did fill up. It had started to look like we were, uh, you know, as the company got smaller, mm -hmm. we were rambling around this huge place. <laughs> but he had tremendous ambition, this guy. He was just like Danny DeVito. He looked like Danny DeVito, and he talked like him, and he, and he just ran around shouting at people, and it was, it was completely crazy. Crazy, and, in a, crazy in a good way, or was oh, it? Oh, yeah, in a good way, yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, and the game programmers, these these guys were geniuses, but they were also, um, I don't know, uh, nerd isn't the right word, uh, non-social, anti-social, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's all I could do was, was program games. They didn't work in the company. Yeah. He wouldn't let them in the, in the <laughs> door. They all had to come once a week with their stuff and, and work at home. But these people were amazing. There was one, oh, you know, I'm really sorry about it. I don't have all the names in front of me. Um, I, uh, a little game where, a centipede, centipede, uh -huh. yeah. This guy was such a genius, and uh, he, he really did have some kind of um, autism or... On the spot. On the spectrum, yeah. <laughs> Some kind of genius, yeah. genius to, uh, um, DNA. Yeah. Huh. And uh, there was one game he wrote where people threw knives at each other. You know, just just sit and <laughs> hurl knives across the, the the screen at each other, and if you got hit, he, he said, "You got me," except. Apple didn't speak at that time. There was no speech. There was no nothing. He had poked sound until he got that computer. He had written that with with beeps. You got you got me like that. It was it was absolutely amazing what they did. These guys did. There was there was a, a whole little division of crazies in the in the company that that fixed things and built hardware. And uh, it was Mark Nelson was the guy's name. And we used to call him Nuke Nelson because he would come in, he would look at your hard drives. He says, it's nuked. <laughs> Nuke. <laughs> this is his favorite word. It was either God or it was nuked. That's was a really funny guy. <laughs> they were all geniuses. And uh, I think Dave was 32. Mm -hmm. And everybody else was in their 20s, except for a couple teenagers. So it was absolutely amazing. Huh. Amazing place. Wow. And, uh, so yeah. you, when you left, you were going to be an author, and I know you wrote a couple of computer books. Did you, were, what else did you, I mean, were you an author for, how long did, how did that work out? Oh, yeah, no, I, I never did another thing with, with publishing. After that, I was extremely lucky this is a really good story. So after Datamost went over the cliff, I was uh, sitting there painting my house, wondering what I was going to do to make money. And a friend of mine called me and said there was a job at Cal State Long Beach that her mother had this best-selling book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And <laughs> Everyone knows that book, sure. And that the university had created a entire de a little department. It's called the study center, uh, called the Center for the Educational Applications of Brain Hemisphere Research, that was going to have a research into these drawing programs, and that they needed an administrator. And there was actually a you know University of California or Cal State system job coming up. So uh, I should apply for it. 
So it turned out that the dean of the department, who had just come in, had a, a didn't like this program, didn't like her. So he wanted his girlfriend to get this job. So he wrote the job so that it was full of computer skills that his girlfriend had. You know how they do that in universities? They they write the job with these weird requirements so that only the person they want to have get the job will get the job. So they wanted DBase. I don't know why the hell they wanted DBase, but she knew DBase. So uh, it happened that I knew it very well, and I knew a lot of other things, and I knew Photoshop and things that artists needed. So I got the job, and he was really pissed at that. And I was really lucky. I had this dream job of doing these drawing workshops all over the country. And um, one of the uh, there was a uh, illustration subdivision at Cal State Long Beach. Very interesting because nobody taught illustration. It was all modern art at the time, except this one little group of people with great illustrators. And they had a course in computer animation because one of their friends, anyway, uh, was doing beginning animation on the Atari, actually. So they had this course, and he taught it one year and then went away, and, and it stayed on the books for three years with nobody teaching it. And according to the rules, if you don't teach a course for three years, it has to drop off the list. So they came to me, can you teach this course? And I said, sure. So I went in, <clears throat> it was called computer animation. And as soon as I got into the class, I said, uh, you know, a lot of things have happened. <laughs> We're gonna learn Photoshop, because this is what you need to know. So it became a Photoshop class. And then <clears throat> we, used to, we used to go to, uh, meetings of uh, computers and disabilities that were going on and I learned about HyperCard. And I said, geez, I really want to learn HyperCard. So I came back to the class and I said, uh, I'm only interested in what I don't know. You know, I'm not interested in it because you, you have to learn new stuff every single day if you're interested in computers. You spend all your time learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, with my own money, don't tell the dean, I'm going to hire this guy for three weeks to teach all of us, and I'm going to be a student, and we're all going to learn HyperCard. And, and uh, Robert Ornstein, he, he came, and, he, and we paid him, and we learned HyperCard. So that's how we did animation, and we had the first um, – well, I, I don't know, very first, but it was like um, World Wide Web, except it was HyperCard. There was a very early uh, network throughout the Cal State system called the California Backbone. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it was one of the first networks before the Internet. And if you did a HyperCard stack, someone up in... Uh, Modesto or UC Davis or wherever it is could could play it and interact. It was really fantastic. This was like 82 or something like that, 83. So it was really fantastic. Um, so you mentioned you have some stuff in storage. and I'm, You said you have your original Atari 800. I'm, I would like to know, I know you're not there in Santa Monica, but uh, what do you have and what do you have on, what, do you, what might you have? What treasures might uh, be waiting to be revealed? Oh, how about Aztec in the original box? Never played. Nice. I have a little box of, of, of Datamos games. Nice. And, do you have any source code or anything? No, yeah, uh, no. Yeah. No, I don't. Because I wasn't the programmer, so right. I didn't do that. So we, you we know both, what? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, fantastic porting the games from one machine to another. These guys, I, I don't, um, you know, Mark Nelson and his buddies, they took an Atari and an IBM and took a card from one and 
with some cabling, put it into the, what do you call it that you put into the Atari? The, the cartridge slot or the? Cartridge slot? Yeah. And ported stuff over. They huh. used to hot swap cards while <laughs> the computer was running because that's the only way they could boot it and get the card in, which had a cable going over to another machine. Huh. And then the, a lot of the game characters and stuff they programmed in machine language. So they had these wall size um, checker, you know, what do they call that, graph paper, covering entire walls with, with all the game characters drawn as X's on, on the graph paper that they would have to program the, the uh, location of the characters in machine language to get them to play. It was, it was fantastic watching these guys. They wow. were just geniuses. You know, it was really fun. I mean, you know, you had to program the sounds with little, you know, zeros and ones. It was it was fantastic what they were able to do. Nice. So, yeah, we mostly talked about books, but it, how were you involved with the software? Were you assigning well, games? Were you do, testing? I had to do the instruction, little little cheat that went in. I was very involved with the design of the box and uh, the description of it that went out in the advertising, the advertising for it, and you know all that stuff. So we were all all working very closely together. All these things. So, the, but the and, light. Sorry, go ahead. That was the lifeblood of the company in the beginning. Was the games? You know? Yeah, and that was all Dave was interested in was the games. Just left the books to me, mostly. When I talked to uh, um, Gary Koffler the other day, he said that, yeah, he said that the, the books are like where the money came from, but but the software was was what Dave was interested in. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. And his brother-in-law uh, Kelly, Jim Kelly, I can't remember his first name. He was a child. I mean, a a, a, a grown up <laughs> with a with a, a gamer's mentality. They would get new. They would buy every game. And um, oh, what was the name of it? Something started with a B. That was the one that was set way ahead of them on the games. They would get these games, and and the first day they would spend playing the game. I mean, nothing, everything would stop. They would be playing these games all day, someone else's game. And then the next day they would spend cracking the, the copy protection. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they were just a bunch of children. It was, it was just great being in there. Nice. Did you feel, you said you were older than most of the, the, the crowd. So did you feel like, uh, you were, you were laughing at the children, or are you playing along? Or how how were you? But no, you know, I was in awe of them, absolutely in awe of them. You know, they they were like violinists in a in a symphony orchestra. They were all great at what they were doing. It was just awesome being around these people, and the whole field was was unbelievable. I I remember a story about AOL that that they were in business for seven years before they had a hundred thousand users, you know, <laughs> I said, Oh, I'm going to get a modem. I go online. I went online. There's nothing there. <laughs> you can send an email. That was about it. Yeah. It was, but I don't know why we did it or why we were so fascinated with it. It was fun. It's it, we, fun. It, no, you had to have it. If it was a, <laughs> if it was a new thing, you had to have it. It was, it was unbelievable. Uh, so now I'm curious, uh, I, I know you're, you live in a tiny town in France. It's like population 500 or something, right? Yes. Yes. How did that happen? And, uh, what are you doing in France? Oh, this is really wonderful. So <clears throat> my dear one was a, uh, a, a painter trained as a painter and, um, when she had a child with a disability, she realized that she could not be an artist and a, you know, a full-time mother to a, you know, she had to work, in other words. So she dropped the art. 
but she had studied in the Beaux Arts in in Paris in the 60s. And I don't know if you remember May 1960, there was a, a 60s type riot in Paris where uh, they pulled up the street pavers and threw them at the police and things like that. So she was very much uh, in this whole 60s art thing in, in Paris and always dreamed about it. So uh, she went to a conference in Europe and came back with the, this was in 2002, so she went to a conference about uh, computers and disabilities and came back with these brochures from a real estate company that she, you know, you, you go by in Europe, I guess in the States too, they, they have all these pictures of houses in the windows and you can go in and get a sheet with the, sure. with the, with yeah. the house. So she bought back a bunch of these things and, and these cute little houses and farms and all kinds of stuff were between 140000 and 200000 dollars US uh, the uh, the euro was actually cheaper in 2002 it was 93 cents for a euro so it seemed like a really great thing to do and and our son with the disability was you know it, um, I guess he was in his 30s he was grown up and and still living in the house that we have in Santa Monica, and we thought it's, you know, it's time for him to be on his own. And the best way is for us to move out. The house was all grooved out for him with ramps and special bathrooms and everything. So it was his house. And we decided that we had to be a long way away for him to really be independent. And here was our dream. We could go to Europe and still interested in art and see art all over and it's been really great. It's been like 11 years now. It's really nice. wonderful. Your town's called y Yimere? Is that how you? Yimere. Yimere? Yes. yes. Oh. I'll tell you. Google it. and It's a really tiny. I, it's really fun. I looked it up. Well, yeah, yeah, I was researching. I was trying to find you. And I, if, if the, the LinkedIn connection didn't work, the only other thing I knew was that you're in Yimere, France. So I, I was going to write a letter and I had a feeling if I did Hal Glixman, Yimere, France, it would find you. So, but I didn't need to do that. They have something very retro in, in France that you'd really love. It's called a phone book. Hmm. And I'm actually in there in a printed phone book. <laughs> nice. I don't know I will have to be hard to find anymore. <laughs> um, so what do you do today? Oh, oh, we have a... a organic garden I mean, it's not big but it's it's enough to you know eat and we have two horses nice and i still do art things actually i'm doing a, a wonderful exhibition i was the first one to show chicano art in la and i did a show at irvine in 1972 1973 called los four about a group of chicano artists and they went on to become quite famous. They went, the show went to the L.A. County Museum, and it became a big deal. So the Getty Museum is sponsoring an entire year of Latino, Chicano, and uh, Latin American art. So they asked me to come out of retirement and organize that exhibition for UC Irvine. So that's really nice. Gilbert... Magu Luhan, if you got people who are interested in art, they could look up Chicano art. So I'm, gonna, I'm doing that. And nice. They actually gave me a, a grant two years ago just for the research, for two years of research, and then a grant for this year. To, the exhibition opens in uh, October at UC Irvine. But anyone who's in L.A., that's going to be – Chicano and Latino stuff all over LA. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. So that keeps me busy. And, uh, you know, we go once a week to Paris, uh, twice a week to Chartres to shop. Chartres really close, has that gorgeous cathedral and great restaurants and all kinds of fun things. And, you know, we can get in the car and be in 
Holland, Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, all in one day's driving. You know, it's like a <clears throat> San Francisco to L.A. to be in Germany. Unbelievable. It's just really fun. That's awesome. Sounds great. Yeah. Get that, our uh, whatever it is, retirement fund. <laughs> 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 We're going to know. What the fuck are you going to be eating Scrabble in your old age? <laughs> uh, so, or what haven't I asked you about the data most days that I should have? What what story haven't I heard? Oh, let's see. Well, besides moving every three months to a bigger place, there was um, something went on which I I never did understand that there was a company in New York that wanted to buy data most and they made a huge offer and, and really all they wanted to do was kill it off so that their other company would, would not have a competition. I don't, I don't know half the things, but from day one, there was machinations. I guess being a historian of Atari, you know that the financial thing behind the scenes is just cutthroat and and constant. I, I was not a part of all that, but I could see that, you know, in Dave's face, it was a good day and a bad day. And, and uh, they were always in the red. They told people, don't don't take your check to the bank till Monday, you know, your paycheck and stuff like that. It was, it was really unbelievable how, how it, it uh, you, you have to have nerves of steel and incredible ambition to start a company, not because of the technology, but because of the craziness with the financing and the people who are going to try to shoot you down. It was, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, I don't know, you go into museums and, and they are so beautiful and everything, but inside is horrible squabbling and fighting and you know the Pompidou Museum is going to be closed for 12 days because of a strike right now you know, our favorite museum in Paris but you know in all these organizations the most unbelievable stuff happens in the in the background so yeah. interesting okay. interesting stories Datamos did not last a long time, really. I mean, uh, from 82 to 84, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, three three years. Yeah, so... But you guys... And, and David already done one company and sold it. Right, yeah. And you guys and put out a prolific amount of books and software in that short amount of time. Yes, but so did everybody else. That was their problem. <laughs> Our favorite actually was Sierra. I just loved their games. Yeah, we used to go up there and visit. It was it was in this idyllic little mountain town in in the Gold Rush country. Uh -huh. Yeah, nice. you hung out with uh, Ken and Roberta, or what? I knew Roberta, but yeah, yeah. We, we hung out. But we were honored guests anyway. <laughs> we went up there. Oh, yeah. nice! That's awesome. So, Anyway, it was a good life. It would really save me. Yeah. Because, you know, it was between the art thing and the art school uh, transition and the other job, I needed something. And, and there's nothing like, um, um, well, call it a midlife crisis, but reinventing yourself and changing fields and learning something new is really exciting and it was a new love for me at the same time you know it was really a great great period in my life to, to be able to start over again and go in with all these kids and and hold your head up high and do your end of the work you know yeah. learning all this stuff that you never knew it's, wow. it's just fantastic nice can i ask so, how old you are now sure. Uh, I'm going to be 80 this year. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about Nolan Bushnell. I looked him up. Yeah. He's into anti-aging. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking he probably shouldn't be eating all that pizza <laughs> when he was in his 40s. 
<laughs> the pizza and the, the drugs. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's into all sorts of things. I keep seeing him on the news. He's doing new, new businesses and trying new things. And the I read he's done 20 businesses or something already. So. Yeah. Yeah, he's persistent for sure. I did I did reach out to um, Dave's son to see if they had anything. What I especially wanted was that um, uh, Gannon, oh, what's his name, the, the wonderful um, writer, uh, illustrator, illustrator, uh, could get a hold of him. He used to paint a, a small painting for every book cover. And did they have those paintings? And he didn't have them. So I don't know what happened to those. It would be fun to find some of that original stuff. And you're talking about source code. This was, these were really nice paintings and drawings and things that he did. They were wonderful. So. Um, all right, I think this is my last question for now until August. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari community that still exists and is listening to this podcast, uh, what would you tell them? Oh, have fun. And that these big block pixels, you know, has, have, have come back as a, as a design element. You know, things that look like <laughs> And, and uh, Pac-Man and all that. Yeah, that's that's all the rage now. I can't believe it that people who have all these slick, looks like a movie games, they want to play these little beep beep beep. beep. <laughs> but I asked Dave about that. Dave Gordon. I, yeah. I said, "What's this centipede? I mean, it's just a little thing crawling around." He says, "You're not a game player. It has playability." You know, it has the right, um, I don't know what you do with the game controller thing, that uh, that's what those old games had, This, you know, this kind of adrenaline rush. Did yeah. Aztec ever end up on the Atari? Uh, yes, yes it did. Yeah, that was a great game. That was really wonderful. There was... Anyway, what, what what's your what's our what best games game? what game uh well, yeah, what other games stick with you as most memorable or your favorite or something? <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid it's not an Atari game. Well, that's it's right. Cranston right. Manor by Sierra. Oh, we used to spend hours, you know it's an adventure game. We used to spend hours with that game, huh. and you had a type text in to play it. It was really really primitive, but. We, we had so much fun solving that one. Huh. Cranston Manor. Cran oh, yeah, there it is. I don't know that one. So it looks pretty. Yeah, and nice graphics. Nice. All right. Well, um, yeah, you guys, I played a lot of Mr. Robot that you guys uh, came out with. Mr. Robot and his Robot Factory. Oh, and you know, I think that was one of the very first where you get to make the game. Yeah. That was really great. Yeah, he was he was really a great programmer too. And there was this <laughs> this guy uh, Cohen. I forget his first name. He was working on one called Cohen's Towers, which is mainly jumping in and out of elevators. And and I came in one day. He was sitting there showing, you know, working on his on this program. And I says, uh, "How are you doing on Gordon's Towers?" He says. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm looking at this. I've never played Cor uh, Gordon's. I mean, <laughs> Cohen's Towers. But I'm looking at the screenshots now. Nice. So, you know, I bet that Atari would fire up if I dusted it off. Don't okay. you think? Oh, yeah. Sitting in the shelf in the garage. Those things are pretty rock solid. Yeah, yeah. I was amazed at how amazingly, oh, str strongly they were built. Uh, one other story. There's this wonderful person named Ken Yankelowitz. I tried to look him up. He was a Hughes engineer, and he bought two thousand Atari four hundreds. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, they went out of business or did something anyway. He got 2,000 of them. He sold 1,000 of them to a guy who gave them away. If you went to look at condos, you know, win a free computer, come and see our condo. Okay. <laughs> it's a, so he got a, a thousand of them practically for free with that transaction. And he made them into a home controller for people with disabilities. Oh, gee. Where it was a little screen that would scan uh-huh. and all you had to do was push a button. It would get to turn the lights on, turn the lights off, open door, closed door, you know, anything you wanted, you could program on this machine. Oh. And he put it in a little box with his name on it, and inside was an Atari 400. Oh, and he had enough of those that he he kept that system going for years with these little Atari 400s inside I, there that nobody knew what, what it was. Well, I'd like to talk to him. What was, what was his name? Really Ken Yankalevich. Guess on the spelling for me. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, J A N something or other. I tried to find him on the internet. I couldn't find him. So he he and his wife would go to swap meets. And there was a lot of games at swap meets. And he would buy games that didn't work anymore. And, and Ataris that didn't work anymore. And he would sit there while he was at the game, polishing the, the uh, lead, you know, those things where you plug in the they contacts. had gold yeah. contacts, yeah. polishing the contacts with uh, uh, an eraser, and they would work. <laughs> <laughs> he could fix them. So yes. that was the other thing that he that he bought and sold computers at swap meets and made his computers for the disabilities. And he said those Ataris were indestructible; they would last forever. Those little machines. So they were really amazing, beautiful machines. Oh, another person, another person. It, <laughs> the guy that that we were going to write the Mr. Chip thing. He had invented a cartridge that would go in the, let's see, it was the 800 that had the two slots? Yep. There was never anything for slot number two. Hardly they anything. Were just, yeah. 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 So he made uh, a cartridge for slot number two that would steal what was in slot number one and <laughs> cop <laughs> and they dumped on him and sued him and said he and he had to give it up and and give away give them all the all of the cartridges that he had made and completely get out of the atari business but, but this was the kind of genius as we had working there that he would invent something like that great thank you so much you're welcome